Hello and welcome to Fantastic History. I'm Clay. And I'm Sarah. We're a husband and wife duo who enjoy telling each other about amazing events, people, and mysteries throughout history. Sarah. Yes. Do you like pranks? <gasps> I love pranks, as long as they're not being done to me. <laughs> and jokes. Love jokes. Love a good joke. And hoaxes. Um. Well, it depends. Well, I'm very excited to tell you about one of history's great pranksters. Johnny Knoxville. <laughs> he's a good one. Yeah. He's a, he's a great one. I'd say. Um, but this one that I'm going to tell you about has largely been forgotten. Oh. Chris Pontius. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Excuse me. Let's, uh, let me just tell you. It's not from Jackass. No, it's not. Okay. <laughs> Um, most of the story I'm sharing today, I learned from a book called The Sultan of Zanzibar, The Bizarre World and Spectacular Hoaxes of Horace Devier Cole Oh, by um, Martin Downer. And it's pretty much the only book out there about this guy. Oh, so this is your Attila Ambrose. Kind of. Okay. I, I, I think he's a bit more well known about, uh, and we'll get into why that is, but... I uh, just wanted to give a big kudos to Martin Downer's research on this guy. So Horace was born on May 5th, 1881 into a prosperous Irish family. He was actually born in the Blarney Castle, home of the Blarney Stone itself. Whoa, okay. At 10, he fell terribly ill with diphtheria, which nearly killed him. Oof. But instead left him uh, with a uh, hearing Im- impairment. Okay. In 1990, he enlisted to fight in the Boer War, and only a couple of months after his deployment, he was shot in the back. Well, he survived, but he was crippled, and at the end of a brief career in the military, and his hearing impairment did not really help him much either with that, so um, so now he had a hearing impairment and a physical impairment, which meant only one thing. He went to school. Okay. He went to uh, Trinity College at Cambridge. Oh, all right. I've heard of that. Now, Cambridge at this time did not have the reputation that it does now. Martin Downer explains in the book, he says this, quote, The university then was nothing like the well-ordered career-focused institution of today. It was small, insular, and predominantly male, with an air of disorder which occasionally erupted into anarchy. A visit from the king and queen uh, to Cambridge during Horace's second year was met with rioting and a vast configuration of broken furniture on Parker's Peace. I gotta be honest with you. When I picture Cambridge, I don't imagine that sort of scene at all. It seems like it was much rougher back then. Yeah. Well, Horace was an aloof student. Okay. But he wasn't a party animal necessarily. He did drink heavily, and while drunk, he could be quite violent. (laughs) Well, yes. Okay. Oh, Now, during his first year at Cambridge, Horace made good friends with a man named Adrian Stephen. Now, Adrian would go on to be Horace's closer partner during his pranks. And Adrian had two sisters with whom Horace became close with as well, Vanessa and Virginia. Okay. And we'll come back to them a little bit later. Horace and Adrian would begin playing small pranks around Cambridge. Nothing too terribly noteworthy and we don't really have a, we don't really know a whole lot about them now but it was in their second year that one of their most famous pranks would take place oh boy horace came to know that the sultan of zanzibar was planning a visit to england and this sparked the idea for the hoax the two would uh, began to devise a plan to prank their school and they would enlist the help of friends and together they would disguise themselves as the sultan and their entourage for an impromptu visit to tour Cambridge. Now, before we go any further, I want to remind you, our listeners, that this took time, this took place at a very different time as far as cultural norms go. Oh, and when we talk about people in upper Edwardian England, um, they viewed things differently. What, what was considered socially acceptable is obviously different from now. Uh, yes. I mean, you, what you said this was in the early 90s? 1900s. Oh, okay. I was definitely picturing the 90s this entire <laughs> time. Okay. I'm glad I asked. 1900s. 
Very different. Yes. Indeed. That Edwardian comment makes more sense now. (laughs) (laughs) Things were different in the 90s as well, but uh, much more so. So when we talk about... um, these these white people dressing up as Africans. Oh no! And in makeup. Oh no! Yeah, keep in mind that's that not a funny prank. It's not what would be seen today. Mm, well, you would really, really hope not. No, maybe in the early nineties. Well, oh, certainly. Ask Justin Trudeau. And also, the intention of the hoaxes were not to insult Africans. It wasn't the it wasn't the mm-hmm. intention to play the part of the minstrel it was to prank the school and higher offices of education and government right the africans weren't meant to be the butt of the joke exactly okay gotcha but of course i still hate it but yeah i'm, it's, I'm with you it's uh it, it's it's handled with um the the grace that one would expect of the time um, and of a college student and of a college student yeah but I just wanted to get that out of the way okay? because, you know, it is what it is. Right. Probably why he's not talked about quite as much anymore. I can see why, yeah. But with that out of the way, let's continue. Okay. So the event took place on March 2nd, 1905, not 95, when the Sultan <laughs> was to be visiting London. He had sent a telegram to Cambridge ahead of time informing the University of the Sultan's intention to tour the school. Horace did. However, newspapers announced that the Sultan, the real Sultan, would be visiting Buckingham Palace the same day. Oh, no. Which made a trip to Cambridge impossible. Right. Also, the Sultan's picture was making uh, public, uh, was showing up in newspapers. And since that's the case, disguising oneself as (sighs) a person who's in all the newspapers, Mm -hmm. it's going to make it very, not very convincing. Right. So they quickly changed plans uh, from the sultan visiting to the sultan's uncle. Uh, okay. Prince Mukasa Ali. Adrian and three others would make up the party from Zanzibar. And a fifth member would uh, play the part of a white translator. His acquaintance, Willie Clarkson, provided the group with a qu- with quality theatrical costumes and did their makeup. Uh, Horace was, Horace knew that this was going to be a big deal, something to remember. And he wanted to get pictures of everybody, uh, before they went off on their hoax. We will not be posting this picture on our Instagram, by the way. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, and ta- and I remember taking a picture at this time was, it, it took a lot of time. Mm-hmm. It, it wasn't as quick right. as it is now. Right. So they actually missed their train. I mean, even in the 90s, it wasn't as quick as it was <laughs> That's now, quite true. frankly. <laughs> That's true. Um, but they took their pictures. They caught the next train. And actually, as, as you said, th- those pictures still do exist, which which gives it a, uh, um, you know, it it, it, it it makes it more than just a story that is told in the distant right. past. Um, so when they finally arrived at Cambridge by train, they were met by Mayor Campkin. Horace recalled to the papers, we only had to grunt, and the mayor and the town clerk bent their heads and welcomed us. Oh, boy. They were offered champagne, which they refused on account of being uh, of the Muslim religion, as they were. Ah. But they also didn't want to ruin their disguise. Mm Mm-hmm. And then they took a lovely tour of their university. (laughs) Horace took great pleasure at the sight of the college porters with whom he had feuded over the years, (laughs) now bowing to him. (laughs) And during their tour, nobody recognized them, despite seeing several good friends very close up. Oh, wow. Well, this this lasted less than an hour. Um, They decided it was time to go ahead and end the charade. They demanded to be taken back to the station, but there was a problem. They had originally intended to take the train to London, but that would require them to take the return trip from London. Right. And that trip was going to be far too long because they were required to be back at 10 o'clock as undergrads. Oh, I see. So they really had no good way to leave. Mm -hmm. So after a prolonged and unnecessarily extravagant goodbye to their hosts, (laughs) they just ran. Oh my God. Now, some say they entered the train and exited another side, but I like to think they just booked it. <laughs> right. Uh, the, the, these these folks who had never been to England just, just took off, leaving the bewildered mayor sit standing there on the platform. 
is this this is on like Parks and Rec or Thirty Rock or like there's a show like that that did this sort of bit. Okay. And it's going to bother me until I remember what <laughs> it was. Yeah. It, it seems like a classic um situation. Yes. Um Miraculously, they were able to hail cabs and be taken out of the city without being caught. And after a celebratory dinner, they returned to their oblivious college that they were just at hours earlier. Wow. Now, Horace took this story straight to the Daily Mail the next day. (laughs) Now, perhaps it was his privileged life that gave him the confidence that nothing was going to happen to him. Uh Uh-huh. Or maybe because he wanted to simply be in control of the story. Of his own making. Either way, it printed the following day. Mayor hoaxed. Cambridge undergrads daring trick. Supposed royal visit. Imposters received with civic honors. Oh, no. It was an extremely embarrassing embarrassing story for the school. No kidding. And especially the mayor. Oh, yeah. So much so that the Cambridge Daily News ran its own story. With the headline, A Stupid Hoax, The Mayor Victimized by Undergrads. Oh, okay. Well, that's a little dramatic. It is a little dramatic. Well, the story went as viral as it could in those days. Newspapers were gobbling up the story. Postcards were made and Horace was getting all this attention. He regaled his classmates with the adventure. He autographed pictures. And he he was even offered a book deal out of this. Oh, wow. From one prank. From one prank. Okay. And as for the repercussions that Horace was not afraid of, well, it turns out he was right. The authorities did nothing, and the mayor, although his ego was wrecked, really had no way to get at them. And if he tried, it probably would have made him look a little bit more daft. I mean, because what law were they breaking? Yeah. they. uh, I'm I'm sure they, they possibly could have caught them in something like... Um, like forging a telegram from an official. Right, impersonating royalty or something. I can see in a, a monarchy there being rules around that. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, they, they, they got off pretty scot-free. And after a couple of weeks, the prank had blown over. And there were still exams to be taken because they were still in school. Oh, boy. But Horace didn't sit his exam. Instead, graduating a first-class practical jokes degree. So Virginia... Is that accredited? (laughs) (laughs) It's not. It's something he made up. Oh, it's a shame. Um, But Virginia recalls, instead of going to the bar or becoming a man of business, he he made it his business simply to make people laugh. Okay. Now, in 1906, his grandmother passed... Hmm. Leaving Horace a massive estate worth millions. Oh, what? Huge. Um, Did he get to keep the Blarney Stone? <laughs> it wasn't the Blarney Stone. Oh, okay. Um, but it was a massive, massive mansion, land, all sorts of crazy stuff. <laughs> so who needs a degree, frankly? <laughs> well, Horace did later sell it to his uncle because... He couldn't afford to pay the taxes on it. <laughs> a now, tale as old as time. Yeah. Well, investing the money he got from the sale into rental properties and other investments, he didn't have to worry about money for a while. Mm-hmm. Now, let's skip ahead to 1910. Horace gathered his friends to perform another hoax. The most famous hoax. Ooh. And this time, uh, this was a time when British pride was very high. Yeah. And they were especially proud of their naval fleet. Enter the HMS Dreadnought. I have heard of that. Well, maybe you've heard of this story. Oh, boy. This was the fastest, strongest, bestest, most advanced ship ever built. And it was also expensive. And but, hor- Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say you would expect that of the bestest, fastest ship ever built. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Horace had spent some time after leaving Cambridge working with charities. And he already leaned pretty uh, towards socialism politically. Okay. So seeing so much money built on warships while the poor were suffering (laughs) likely had an impact. It's unclear who is responsible for giving Horace the idea for the hoax. But one reason he may have accepted the challenge was to have a chance to embarrass the Royal Navy. The ultimate pride of England. Oh, boy. Okay. But Virginia... 
um, claimed the following in 1940. The officers of the HMS Hawk and the Dreadnought had a feud, and Cole's friend who was on the Hawk had come to Cole and said to him, you are great, you're a great hand at hoaxing people. Couldn't you do something to pull the leg of the Dreadnought? Oh, no. So the hoax took place on February 7th, 1910. Willie Clarkson once again pro- provided the disguises. They dressed as Prince Malakin of Abyssinia and his party, with Horace acting as the translator this time. Adrian again joined in. However, this time, Virginia demanded to be involved, <laughs> and after much, much persuasion, she joined in dressed as one of the princes with a beard. Oh, good for her. They sent a telegram ahead of their arrival and boarded the train, just like last time. When they arrived, they half expected a company of police to be waiting for them, because this wasn't visiting Cambridge. They were visiting the Dreadnought. Right. But instead, they were greeted with a small crowd of people. Oh, no. A group of Marines lined across a red carpet, (gasps) and the flag Lieutenant Peter Willoughby... In full uniform. Oh, no. (laughs) They were then taken straight to the Dreadnought. Mm. And in a case of ironic coincidence, the bandmaster on board the ship waiting to greet the royal visitor did not know the Abyssinian national anthem, so he chose another one that he considered a respectful substitute. The national anthem of Zanzibar. Uh, Oh, my God. (laughs) One might expect, as they approached (laughs) the ship, a sense of dread falling over them. Oh, no. But it was a coincidence. Okay. (laughs) An amazing coincidence. Oh, my God. They were met on board by a a large welcoming party and Admiral May, Adrian and Virginia's cousin, who greeted them and saluted them. Was... This cousin in on the prank? No. Oh, dear. Okay. He was the, I believe he was the highest ranking uh, military figure on the ship. Oh, my God. So, yeah. (laughs) Oh, no. With Horace taking the part of the translator, it allowed him the joy of speaking English to his victims and regaling them with stories (laughs) made up at his whim um, as they were taken on a tour of the mighty ship. Oh, my. At one point, the wind began to pull away at one of their mustaches, <gasps> uh, which required a quick exit to the bathroom to avoid it being seen. But it appears that was the that was the only time when their oh. costumes failed them. Oh, my. Oh, dear. When, now, when translating um, between Horace and, let's say, Adrian, they couldn't actually speak the Abyssinian language. Right. Uh, but luckily... And unsurprisingly, no one on the ship did either. So the men spoke to each other in a in a mixture of Greek and Latin. Oh, wow. Which the Admiral was not able to pick up on. And it must have felt very nice for them to be speaking in these classic languages to each other mm-hmm. while the Admiral stood there not knowing That's what amazing. they were saying. A little elitism right. going on. In an act of full confidence in his friends, Horace took tea with the Admiral below deck while the rest of them continued on their tour above deck. (laughs) After less than an hour on board, hunger and thirst set in, as they could do neither without ruining the disguises and makeup and all Mm -hmm. that. So they ended the tour and were taken back to shore. They quickly entered their train where Cole continued the charade, insisting that the princes be served by the stewards wearing white gloves. (laughs) Well, now with the hoax complete, they decided not to make their, uh, not to make it public, uh, because at this point some of them were feeling, they they felt bad, because they had embarrassed the navy. The mm. navy had they had been so kind to them. Right. They thought maybe we shouldn't push this in their faces. Mm-hmm. But Horace was not one to keep his antics hidden. That would have been my guess. I mean. Obviously, somebody talked or we wouldn't know about it right now. Exactly. Exactly. So as soon as he returned to London, he was looking for people to tell. (laughs) And one of them, probably 
outraged <laughs> by the story for the very reason they were afraid to make it public in the first place. Uh-huh. Informed the foreign office. <gasps> Uh-oh. So Horace decided to come clean the next day. At first, nobody believed him. <laughs> and they hadn't heard of a, a visit to the Dreadnought. But it didn't take long for word to reach Admiral May, who mm. confirmed the visit. Oh, no. Five days after the hoax took place, the story was published in the Express. Sham Abyssinian princes visit the Dreadnought. The story spread like wildfire. I imagine so. Everyone knew Horace was behind the hoax even before his name was leaked. Virginia enjoyed telling the story throughout her life. Shortly after the hoax became public, she gave an interview to the Daily Mirror stating, The only really trying time I had was when I had to shake hands with my cousin, who was an officer on the Dreadnought, and who saluted me as I went on deck. I thought I should burst out laughing, but happily I managed to preserve my oriental stolidity of countenance. After Horace died, Adrian wrote The Dreadnought Hoax, and Virginia printed it. Oh. Horace had not wanted any of them to write about it for the fear of the force of, of the government falling on them, as they had only avoided serious trouble by the skin of their teeth. Right. So with that out of the way, I just I just thought it'd be nice to share a bunch of Horace's pranks with you. <gasps> oh, good. I'm excited. Because those were the two big ones, especially the Dreadnought was, right. was like the big, big one, hoaxing... Hoaxing the Royal Navy is... Just prior to World War One. Yes. Too. Yeah. Is, yeah. Big deal. No joke. I mean, it was, but... <laughs> it is a big deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so here are some of the jokes in no particular order. Okay. This one he called the string joke. <laughs> Horace would pose as a surveyor. He would ask some passerby to assist him with the measurements by holding one end of a ball of string. Mm-hmm. He would then take the ball and walk away and then around a corner <laughs> and he would find some other sap to hold the other end of the string. And then he would sneak away, leaving both men holding either end of the string. <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> this one he called the pulling up Piccadilly joke as it was performed in Piccadilly. That makes sense. Again, with the help of Willie Clarkson, they dressed as workmen with all the necessary tools and equipment to uh, begin uh, working on the main street of Piccadilly. They even recruited a policeman to direct traffic as they began to dig a trench from one side of the road to the other. What? Once the trench was finished, the men acted as if they were taking lunch and just left. <laughs> Leaving this big old trench in the middle of the road. Oh, my God. <laughs> this is jackass. I'm sorry. It's pretty good, right? That's great. I, I feel like they would do that. It's a shame. During his honeymoon with his first wife in Venice on April Fool's Day. Um, honey, no. I can see why this is his first wife because she, no. Okay. <laughs> okay. He put down horse manure in the, in the street at uh, Plaza San Marco. This, <gasps> this caused quite a lot of confusion when found because the city didn't have any horses. Right? <laughs> Where would they go? Yeah. Uh, he hosted a party <sighs> for a group of people who did not know each other. They were strangers <laughs> to one another. <laughs> As they waited for Horace to arrive, they began you know, speaking to each other, making small talk, until at some point they realized that all of their last names had the word bottom in it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sarah's just going to laugh for a, a while. Please uh, don't forget to uh, like us on your favorite platform. Leave a comment and review. We are also on Twitter at Fantastic H Pod. I'm so sorry. I'm okay. Ooh. I should have done a lightning round. This is gonna be this is gonna I'm be so sorry. It, this is gonna be impossible to get through. Okay, okay. All right. Bottom. <laughs> 
Sorry, that was the that was the next word. <laughs> you monster. <laughs> okay. I'm okay. All right. Okay. So in an attempt to get revenge on a victim for one reason or another, Horace ordered a piano from every piano maker in <laughs> London to be delivered on the same morning. <laughs> So when the victim woke up, the road was blocked and packed with dozens and dozens of piano deliveries. Sarah is now crying. I'm sorry. Oh, God. I'm okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep going. Okay. He challenged an old school friend who is now a member of parliament to a race up Berry Street. The race began, and the friend took off, but Horace did not. Instead, he yelled, Stop, thief! He's got my watch! Indeed, he did have Horace's watch, because Horace had planted it there earlier. Oh, come on, man! (laughs) Uh, And his friend was actually apprehended by police. (laughs) But Horace came came after, screaming, It's a prank! It's a prank! (laughs) Now, this prank did get Horace in trouble because he was drunk and he was <gasps> waving around a walking stick at the policeman. Oh, no. And, and he was arrested had to pay, and had to pay a small fine after pleading guilty. <laughs> the stupid prank. Uh-huh. Um, okay. This, this one's going to make you laugh. Oh, no. Horace purchased front row tickets to a theater show and gave them to and, and this one this one is sort of like it's a little muddled by by history and retellings okay if it happened at all which it's hard to tell from from a lot of these how much are were made up in mm-hmm. the in the in the whimsical retellings but he purchased um bet- uh, tickets for between 4 to 8 men and when they arrived they were bald and they had painted on their bald heads the word shit, <laughs> fuck, or bollocks. <laughs> but why? It, for jokes. <laughs> it was for jokes. You're right. I did like that one. Yeah. He would walk down the streets of Piccadilly again with a cow teat hanging out of his fly. Oh, gross, dude. And when he came to a policeman, he would grab the appendage and slice it off with a knife. (gasps) Oh, my God. Very jackass. Yeah. No kidding. I think think Johnny Knoxville might have done that one, actually. It does seem Mm -hmm. up his alley. Mm Mm-hmm. He took a cab ride with a dummy of a naked woman. <laughs> Once again, they saw a policeman, their target, mm-hmm. and the cab stopped. The door opened, and Horace threw the dummy onto the street, yelling, Ungrateful hussy, before driving off. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, no. What poor hussy. <laughs> Near the beginning of World War I, a dance was held at the 400 Club for men back on... Uh, from men back on leave from the front. But the dance was, it was a dismal affair Mm -hmm. because of the situation. Yeah. Enter Horace. Oh my God. Dressed in his evening best with two assistants dressed as clergy, carrying large wicker baskets full of ping pong balls. They then solemnly circled the room, people grabbing the balls and throwing them at one another until the room was completely covered to where no one could even walk or dance anymore. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> Just a silly thing to do mm-hmm. uh, during such a um, a sad time. I mean, it seemed like it, it made the party much better. I'm sure it did. Yeah. And post-war, he performed the Crown of Croatia prank. This elaborate prank premise was to sell the title of King of Croatia, which would be enticing for an anonymous rich Englishman who had made it well known to Horace that he wanted to acquire the foreign throne. The Mark was invited to a house on Eaton Place to discuss the arrangements with the Croat uh, minister, 
who was Horace in disguise. Oh, of course. After some haggling, a huge price was agreed upon and a check was written and handed to Horace. <laughs> Horace told the man to return later to receive the crown from a delegation of Croatian bishops, generals, and statesmen currently en route. When the Mark returned, dressed to the nines for his coronation. Oh my God. He, uh, he was again welcomed into the, ho- into the house and taken to the drawing room where Horace and friends sat drinking champagne <laughs> out of costume and his check was framed on the wall. Oh my God. <laughs> I gotta be honest and I apologize. I don't know that much about Croatia, but that's probably not how you become king. I don't know. No, it's. I'm sure it's not, but it may have been considered like, oh, I have so much money, I want to buy some sort of um, a title. Like I am so culturally ignorant I that wanna... I believe that money can buy this. Yes. Okay. And gotcha. I'm sure for the right amount of money, it possibly could. In some countries, certainly. <clears throat> but, I mean, mm-hmm. come on. Yeah. It's a pretty good prank. That's a good prank. Well... Sadly, Horace's life was not that of a gleeful prankster. His love life, finances, and health all failed him throughout his life. And he went into exile in France, penniless, relying on the charity of others to even eat. Oh. And on February 25th, 1936, he was found dead from a heart attack. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for that. Well, his life was quite sad which you can read more about in that book, but is also a lot of fun to be had too. In life, he was surrounded by a lot of people who would go on to be very famous. Uh, A couple I want to mention here. His sister, Anne, married Neville Chamberlain. Oh, okay. And Virginia, Adrian's sister who played the prince on the Dreadnought. Yeah. Married shortly after to a man named um, Leonard Wolfe, making her... Virginia Wolf. Oh, shit. My brain didn't even... <laughs> okay. Okay, then. Yeah, I've heard of her. Yeah. So wow. Virginia Wolf dressed up uh, and played a prince on the Dreadnought. Wow. Yeah. All right, Virginia, get it. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> I was just like, I don't know who that man is. Oh, because he's not important. I exactly. see. Wow. Uh. Horace Cole's legacy is lesser known these days. They did happen over a hundred years ago. Yeah. And his biggest pranks were re- relied on blackface and outdated racial stereotypes. Yeah. But he was an eccentric guy, a great prankster. And now you know a little bit more about him. And if you want to know even more about his life and the 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 ups, the downs, and everything in between... Check out that book, The Sultan of Zanzibar by Martin Downer. I am going to have to disagree with you because it's very obvious that his best prank was the bottom party. (laughs) Oh, my God. The bottom party is good. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry that I'm eight years old, but that really... I would go to that party. There's some good pranks. That's a good prank. I like that one yeah. quite a lot. Yeah. Very simple. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and our and our silliness, uh, please take a second to rate, review, and subscribe to us on the podcast app that you're listening to us on. Check us out on Twitter and Instagram for more content. We are Fantastic H Pod on both. And shoot us an email at fantastichistorypod at gmail.com with comments, suggestions for future topics, or just to say hi. Catch you next time.